one man contract. That's my choice. <laughs> Okay, um, I think we're going to, to start shortly now. So I'm, I'm just going to introduce our speaker. So Mark uh, Enrard, and I hope I've said that correctly, <laughs> is uh, an advisory partner at Open Gamma, and he's also a visiting professor at uh, UCL as well. And he's going to talk to us about uh, automatic differentiation today. Um, and. One thing that I would like to say before uh, Mark actually starts this talk is we've also got a few other events planned as well. Um, so next Wednesday we've got an event in the Marriott in Canary Wharf. Uh, somebody you know me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll be speaking on an introduction to high frequency trading. There's not going to be a mathematical introduction because I'm not, I'm not a high frequency trader myself. But it's more just to understand the background behind the market and a bit of the substance behind all the headlines the, over the past few years. Uh, Paul, uh, the founder to these, since if anyone happens to know anyone in Stockholm, uh, will be giving a talk in Stockholm on the same day, on, on Wednesday the 26th as well. So, although maybe none of you might be able to make it, if you do know of anyone in Stockholm, please, please let them know. Uh, and thanks for coming to the, to the venue. Uh, we also have today a photographer from the Wall Street Journal as well. Hello. So I hope you can, uh, you can have some photos taken and enjoy the experience of being in the national press. So. Or maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but just to, just to make you aware of, of the fact that he's here. And without further ado, I don't, don't want to delay the talk any further. Uh, I'd just like to give Mark a, a round of applause to introduce him. Thank you. Uh, so my presentation will be on algorithmic differentiation or automatic differentiation adjoint Algorithmic differentiation, there are several names. I will use AD as a <laughs> short version. And I will discuss this ADID in the framework of capital computation, initial margin, so FRTB SIM, but it's just an excuse to use it, uh, the, the, the technique. Um, whoops, that's hopefully coming back, yeah. So, as an introduction uh, of, to AD, I'd like to say that algorithmic differentiation is magic. And like any good magician, I will start the show, or the presentation as you want, with my best trick. And here is my trick. So, suppose that you are the CEO of a small bank and you have to compute, or you will have to compute soon, the capital for market risk according to the FRTB rules. What they are, it's not important, I will discuss it later, but for the moment you have to compute this number, this magical number. And in your bank you have 100 desks or 100 traders or 100 strategies, whatever you want. And there are 400 risk factors for each of them. So risk factor is anything like interest rate, commodities, equities, implied volatility. So it's just to have a, a starting number. And then you ask the CRO of your bank, the chief risk officer, how long it will take to compute this number. And the number that I did, when I did it, is 40 milliseconds with the most powerful computer of the bank, which is my laptop. Um, so this is a very small bank. So that's 40 milliseconds to compute that number. Then the next question you will ask, naturally, is, yeah, this is a very important number, this capital. No, I don't want only to have the number itself, but the sensitivities of the number. How is that number changing if someone is adding one dollar position on this equity, or one dollar or one million dollar in this interest rate swap tenure? So any of those risk factors that were discussed before can change. Someone can put more position. How does that change my capital number? So what I'm asking you is now I have 100 times 400, that's 40,000 of those inputs. If any of those inputs, each of them individually is changing, what is the impact? So I want to compute the different people have different names marginal or incremental capital, what is happening for a small scenario for one dollar extra. So now the answer from the IT department is it's very easy. I will just bump each of them individually one by one, redo the computation and come with the number. 
So add 40 milliseconds, multiply by 100, multiply by 400, that's, if my computation is correct, 1,600,000 milliseconds, which is roughly half an hour. That's different. 40 milliseconds and half an hour, 30 minutes, that's quite different. Now, that's not very good. So after asking to the CRO about his opinion, the CEO is turning to the CMO, the Chief Magician Officer. Each small bank has this type of magician, uh, believe me, uh, and asking, can you do better? So that's where a little bit of magic is coming, a little bit of fairy dust that you throw on your computer, some smoke is coming out and suddenly you have a better code with AD, algorithmic differentiation, and when you run that code and you want to compute those 40,000 numbers, it takes you, that's again on my very powerful laptop, 144 milliseconds. So to compute those 40,000 numbers, plus the original one, still have the original one, the ratio of computation time is only something like 3 to 4, 3.6 in my example. And that's the magic. With AD, you are able to compute a lot of numbers, a lot of derivatives, in a very small time. Now, I've spent now five minutes telling you it's magic and showing you it's magic. Obviously, the rest of the presentation is to prove you that it is not magic, that you can actually do it without any dust or fairy dust or CMO in your bank. You can just do it yourself. But this is the type of result. I'd I hope this is looking like magic at this time, and then at the end of the presentation it will not look like magic. So that was my introduction, this is magic, and obviously the next slide will say the opposite. Uh, that's the, the plan. First, uh, the, the theory, the, the principles of AD, then uh, what uh, numbers I will apply it to, here SIM or FRTB, and then a couple of examples. A first level of using AD for the computation of sensitivity and a second level using uh, AD on the output of the, the capital computations. Um, so, this is the main slide. Once this is finished, you can enjoy the seats and sleep for the, less, the next 40 minutes. If you understand that, you have everything. So first, what is algorithmic differentiation? I like this way to describe it, is the art of calculating the differentiation of function with a computer. So it's an art more than a science, and it's based only on this rule, and I'm sure you know that rule, you have the chain rule of differentiation. You were 16 year old in high school and you were aware of this already. Now I'd like to look at it with the eye of someone working with computer. So let's first read the, uh, the formula. The derivative of the composition of two functions, so if I do something then something else, and I want to compute the derivative, so the derivative of the composition can be written as the composition of the two derivatives. The composition here is the multiplication of matrix, if you represent the two derivatives by matrices or the composition of linear function or whatever. Uh, because I'm a computer scientist at least for the next five minutes, for me it's multiplication of matrices. And this is an extremely powerful uh, result when you look at it again with the computer science eyes. Why? Suppose that you have finished to develop for your bank this computation of whatever capital, present value or whatever number, so you have implemented all those functions, all those methods in your computer, F, G and whatever else. You have an architecture for it to organize the data flow and so on. When you look at the other side, it's exactly the same. F here, G there, there. So the architecture that is working there for data flow and so on is still working there. So you don't have to think again. You have done your thinking first. You have done the implementation. Everything is done. You don't have to change it. You can reuse it. 
that's amazingly powerful. So no change of architecture. And the second thing is the small dot here, which is matrix multiplication in a computer. Uh, so in general, matrix multiplication is sum of doubles and multiplication of doubles. And that's done extremely efficiently in a computer. That's the most efficient operation, sum and uh, multiplication. Again, a computer scientist may tell me that it's not the most efficient. You can just change other things. But for me, that's extremely efficient. So you have transformed something into something else. You don't have to change the architecture. And this is very fast. That's a dream. So this formula is a dream for what I want to do. And I've added a little bit of a Greek philosopher there, which is different from this one. So it's not Thales, but it's Plato. Uh, roughly, he said that uh, if you, uh, with that formula, you know enough of uh, design of AD to create it yourself. You just have to remember that you, you know it. It's not exactly what he said, but roughly that's his philosophy. <laughs> with a free translation from the ancient Greek, that's what he said. So with that formula, now you have enough to do the magic that I said, that I showed before. So let's try to do that magic. And now you can sleep, as I said, that's finished for the presentation. All the theory is there. It's just a little bit using that theory now. Uh, so what I will do, uh, I will take um, an example of any function where I've inputs, plenty of them, so 0 to PA, the number of inputs. In my original example, that was 40,000. And I have one output, one capital or one PV or whatever. Um, and uh, so my algorithm, I suppose this is known and implemented. So I'm not looking at the first part, the implementation of the algorithm itself. I'm looking at the implementation of AD. So uh, the code will be written in what a computer scientists call SAC, single assignment uh, code, if I'm correct with what it means, which is each line of code will be just a new variable equal a function of the previous one. So at the start, I have all the inputs. I load them into my computer. Then I do a lot of operations on those uh, numbers. So each new line of code is a new variable coming from the others. I'm adding, multiplying, taking exponential of whatever. And at the end, I just output the last one. My output is the last line of code. I output the result. I think this is a fairly generic description of an algorithm. Um, so that's, I suppose that you have that in your computer. All those intermediary functions, you have them also. So I will apply the things recursively. So anything which is there exists already. And I go to the next step. And the next step is what? I want to compute the derivatives, the sensitivities, the, uh, yeah, the differentiation of that function with respect to all the inputs. There are two ways to look at that. Or you think, so I want the derivative of z with respect to a. You can view it as focusing on z or focusing on a. This is two different approach to algorithmic differentiation. One which is called the standard or the forward AD, which is focusing on the A, on the inputs. And one which is called the reverse or adjoint or backward AD, which is focusing on Z, on the, num the output. I will discuss only the adjoint version because it's the most efficient in finance. Uh, and I would need a little bit more time to go through the other. But uh, So let's look only at that side. I will focus on Z. So my output is my focus, which means that everything that I will ever differentiate will be always, I compute the differentiation or the derivative of Z with respect to plenty of things. So Z will always be fixed. To the point that my notation, when I will have something bar, it is the derivative of Z 
which is not written because it's implicit, it's always there, with respect to that a variable, which is the different from if you have done some physics, you add something like b dot, which is the derivative of b with respect to t. Here it's the opposite, b bar is the derivative of z, which is always implicit, with respect to b. So maybe you have to switch a little bit your mind, and that's why it's called reverse or adjoint. You have to look at the problem in the reverse order. So that's for the notation. And how does it work in practice? So that was my starting algorithm. Initiate uh, it, the starting points, the algorithm, and the output. And now I want to compute the derivative of z with respect to everything. There is one line which is very easy, which is the following. What is the derivative of z with respect to z? Okay. That's simple. <laughs> you may remember that's one. And that will be the starting point of my recursive algorithm. So the first point I know, derivative of z with respect to z, is one. And now I will read this from the bottom up. That's why it's called reverse uh, AD or adjoint AD, and at each line, here is what I do. So, all the previous lines have been done. I go to the next line, the next line in reverse order. So, I want to compute the derivative of Z with respect to this new B, the new variable, and I do that how? The derivative with respect to uh, B j is, with, is a derivative with respect to all the intermediary variables multiplied by the derivative of the intermediary variables with respect to this one. So that's my composition of function. So I compose one line with all the previous uh, variable. So the sum on all the previous line of my partial derivatives. This one derivative of z with respect to something I called it b bar, b bar k in this case, and that recursively, I suppose, it has been computed already. Starting from this one, which is one, I have all the other intermediary. So this is known, that appears in my code. This second part, the derivative of b k, that was uh, g, that's the derivative of g. And there, I will suppose that recursively, I have already developed the code for that previous function. Obviously, at the bottom of your library, this one will be plus one, uh, variable b plus variable c. And the derivative of the sum, you can do it manually. Uh, if it is a multiplication, you can do it. If it is an exponential, you can do it. And if it is something more complex, like this is the PV of an exotic derivative, you suppose that you have implemented AD. So it's a recursive algorithm on the code, and within each method, it's again recursive on each line of code. So once you have done that, that you have it, that you have it, you can sum and multiply, and if you go down, up, or down, up, <laughs> up to the first line, down here, you get at the end the derivative of your last z with respect to everything, all the variables, and in, in particular with respect to all the inputs. So it's really recursive on each line of code and recursive on each method you have used in your architecture. Um, yeah, so, and again, at the bottom of your library, this is very easy. This is just some addition and so on. And also, nowhere. I have written what the actual financial meaning of this code is. So it's really something you can do. You don't need to know the model to compute the derivative of the model. You just have the code. So this is each line of code. It's not a formula in a book. It's a line of code. And you apply this mechanism to each line of code. You can do it manually. That's what I have done in the examples. You can do it automatically. You can do it in different ways, but it's very uh, repetitive and it's not too difficult to do. As you have seen, this is it. 
That's the magical, that's the dust. The fairy dust is there in this one line. If you understand that line, that's finished. Now, uh, that's the complexity or the difficulty to write it. What is in terms of computation time? What do I have? Obviously, input, well, that's zero. One, zero, <laughs> complexity. What is the complexity here? For each line of code there, I have one line of code there. It's one to one. The output is the derivative with respect to all the inputs. So the complexity of that does not depend on the number of inputs. It's roughly a constant depending on the length of the code and not the number of inputs. Uh, and you can prove in theory something like what you have here at the bottom is that with this algorithm, computing the function plus all the derivatives, in my example 40,000 of them, the cost in CPU time is uh, bounded by the cost of computing the function itself, this, multiplied by a constant, and this constant is in theory between 3 and 4, let's call it 5, that's a nice rounding of 3. Um, so it's something like all the derivatives plus the function is 5 times the uh, function itself. And that's independent of the number of inputs. Again, my 40,000 will fit into this something like 4 or 5. And that's really the power of this is really one line of code here, one line of code there. What I've said is true if you have only one output. If you have multiple output, then you, uh, you need multiple of those starting points, and then it's more complex. That's why in finance we use mainly this uh, adjoint AD or reverse AD is because usually you have a lot of inputs and one output, the PV or the capital and so on. So this is very good for uh, finance. If you add one input and 20,000 output, then you will go in the opposite direction. But for us, that's the best algorithm. So let me... So now, what do I have? So that's, I've presented the principles, the main, the, the foundation. I will show one example or one method on which I will apply it. And then I will look at the actual uh, implementation and examples. Uh, so uh, this is related to capital computation, market risk capital, or uh, differently to initial margin for bilateral margining. Uh, the reason why I put them together is that the regulators, the Basel Committee, proposed something in 2014. And when the new regulation on something different, on initial margin, came out, the, the, one of the industry proposals by ISDA was to reuse the same methodology to compute initial margin. Because if you throw at the regulator what they have thrown at you, you expect that they will say yes, roughly. So that's why this same methodology appears twice, once in capital, one initial margin, uh, where they are somehow related, but there was no reason to come with the same answer. But if you give the, to the regulator what they gave you, you can expect that they will say yes. So what is the base of this uh, computation, this initial margin or capital computation? First, it is sensitivity based which is very good for AD, obviously. That's why I've selected that. And it is based on computation of sensitivities in this, with this meaning. So for interest rate and credit, you have to compute the sensitivity of the value of your book with respect to some benchmark instruments, so the nodes on an, a curve. So they are uh, for uh, FRTB 10 specific nodes between three months and 30 years and you have to compute the derivative of the PV of your book or each instrument individually or collectively with respect to those different inputs. Sorry, yeah. uh, just getting a little 
caused with the, the, um, the abbreviations. So GIRR is the interest rate. It's not internal rate of return. Or no, no. It's the uh, generic inter uh, interest rate, mm. uh, something like that, and the credit spread. So MPV is? Present value. Present value. So the value okay. of your book. Yeah. And so that the sensitivity of the value with respect to a certain set of given interest rate, three months, six months, one year, up to 30 years, and the same on the credit spread. Okay. For equity, commodity, and forex, it's slightly different. Uh, it is also the derivative of the present value, the value, with respect to the inputs, which are the price of equity, the price of commodities, but here multiply by the level. So this is uh, the change of value for a change of the underlying by one person of its value. Sorry, and what is the sensitivity? Sorry, I'm sorry for the mathematicians here, but I, so why are we interested in the sensitivity? So the, 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 the sensitivity, it's a, it's a very good question. So, uh, and I will try to explain it after. So the goal of those final two numbers is to compute, let's say, a capital. Capital for interest rate uh, risk. So we'll look at how much uh, the PV change for a small change of the underlying and then we will multiply that by some kind of stress test. So by some movement which is not huge but meaningful for whatever we want to compute and meaningful will be different for the capital which is longer term than for initial margin which is for 10 days. But that will be exactly my next slide <laughs> uh, with those numbers. But at this stage, I wanted to say something that actually, if you look at the regulation, FRTB in particular, you will not see anything like that. You will see that in the regulation, the sensitivities or the derivative are written explicitly like a final difference. You have to bump this number by this quantity, by one basis points, and redo the computation. That seems strange that the regulator went and wrote the formula instead of saying you need the sensitivity, they wrote the uh, finite difference formula. So that was in 2014, if my memory, memory is correct. And uh, there was a period where you could ask the Basel Committee uh, for comments, or they ask for comments on their uh, proposal. Obviously, I asked the question, <laughs> can you use uh, AD to compute that number? And uh, the answer came in 2017, almost three years later. There is a frequently asked question by the Basel Committee where they say you can compute it in the way you want as long as the way you compute it is close enough of the formula they have proposed which looks a little bit uh, like the reverse <laughs> of what you expect. So you can compute the correct number if it is close enough to the wrong number they have proposed. But <laughs> I'm happy enough with that solution. Uh, you can use that also for regulation, so that's not, yeah? Have, have they approved any, any banks using AD as a proxy for their finite difference? No, for the simple reason that uh, FRTB is still under discussion. So there is no final rule. <laughs> there is no... Oh, the Basel Committee has proposed the rules, but they have not been implemented by any actual legisl legislation of any country. So on that side, the answer is clearly no, because <laughs> there is nothing that can be approved yet. On the SIM side, where it is a little bit more vague what you have to do, but the same proposal is also with finite difference. There it has been approved for all the banks that use it, for the 19 or 20 banks, by the US regulator. So I don't think that this is their main problem when you have a, a huge banks with huge data flow. The actual numerical technique you use to compute the derivative, I don't think that's a problem. It's more, do you send the right data in it? <laughs> Yeah. Like, did the regulator require you to provide a, something that shows that the, the AD is, is 
within a certain percentage of the planet? That's what they wrote in their uh, frequently asked question, that you have to prove that it is close enough to the actual formula in the regulation. But what close enough means... Like, do you have to prove it to yourself or to them? <laughs> that I cannot answer. <laughs> uh, it's one of those vague terminology. Uh, but at least it's not forbidden. <laughs> That's the, the, the first step. And then when you will do actually on computation of interest rate swaps, the difference will be five dollars on your five billion capital. So I don't think that anybody will look at that. Uh, but it's just the principle it is allowed, which is good. At least for me, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah. Was this exercise performed on, uh, on the complicated colors? Yes. I mean, so I, I will show it. The hard curvature. I mean, I mean, just yeah. The so yeah. So uh, obviously, I mention it for a simple product, but this has to be done for any products, so including exotics and. Final numbers. Um, I mean, <laughs> I think you performed the, 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 the. How far are they? Because I would assume that for uh, complicated exotics, uh, it will not be very close. Yeah, you are perfectly right. I was not uh, planning to discuss that, but now that you ask it. Uh, so, AD, as I've shown, is a formula, a mathematical formula. So, if you implement it correctly, and your initial function is actually differentiable. I have not mentioned it, but I suppose it is. So if you implement it correctly and the function is differentiable, you have the right answers. When you do final difference, there is plenty of numerical noise that can appear. For example, just take a binomial tree pricing of, uh, with black formula, but implement it not with the explicit formula, with binomial tree, you will never get a clean number. It will always be noisy. And it's very easy to show, it's very old from 20 years ago, to show that even this simple example you will have big jumps of the sensitivities. So no, it, it, <laughs> there is no way that if you put any numerical scheme it will be close. Now, I don't know if there is a numerical noise. What? Do you have for capital reason to include your noise in the capital or I don't know that I don't know the, the answer but certainly it's easy to, to design simple examples where the actual differentiation and the finite difference will be uh, apart enough yeah. uh, okay so that's the starting point and then there is a certain number of layers put on that which is you take those sensitivities of derivatives and you multiply them by some quantity provided uh, by the regulators or by the ISDA, which is called a risk weight. For me, it's some kind of uh, scenario. So you, you move your curve by or each point by a certain quantity. So you do this, that's quite easy to do with those numbers. Here is an example of a table of, for interest rate where the numbers are constant, so you don't have to compute them. That's for the delta. For the vega, it's roughly the same. You have the vega numbers multiply also by some kind of risk weight associated to vega. So Sorry, it's. Can you please go back uh, just one slide? Sorry about this. Um, no, to the buckets and yeah. the numbers. Sorry, so I know that's the derivative regulator. Kind of I did, but what's buckets is there regular load? Just buckets and is there? Please define what those are. So, so I just want to. So, Sorry, yeah, I forgot him. So those yeah. oops, those numbers. Yeah. So it's for the change, the derivative for each of a set of uh, tenors. So those are oops, the one here. So for the change of the six months, the one year, and so on. This is the change over the time period. O over, the, let's say, the change today okay. of that quantity. Yeah. And this is to say it will change by 49 basis points on the two years, 58 basis points on the one. Is there? Is there? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, that's uh, international swap and derivative association. Yeah. So the lobby of the the banks. Just want to make sure I'm in the yeah. universe. <laughs> so, but for the moment, is this is just a constant number. You look in a table, multiply, but what by what the sensitivity you have computed, and then you start to to pile those things, aggregate them together. First into buckets. Buckets for interest rate is one currency. For equity, that will be one sector. So you pack them together with some correlation. So there is another number provided, a correlation matrix, and you pack those them uh, those together. So you aggregate according to a correlation. Once you have done it at the bucket level, you have another level the asset class, so all the interest rate delta, all the interest rate vega, and so on. So you pack them again together with the same formula. Actually, not exactly the same formula. Something with a little bit of, I will not call it magical dust, but uh, some special thing. So I, I can go and explain why, but I don't think it's very important. At this stage, what is important is that you have computed your sensitivities, and you pack them up with relatively simple formulas. Yeah. So yeah? It's not, you're saying it's not really important because this is the regulator prescription, right? Like the regulator oh, it is not important for what I want to do, which is show a um, technique, a uh, computer science technique, yeah, yeah. by opposition of what the number means. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, if you want to know what the number means, that it, it's important to look at the details, yes. <laughs> But it's aggregation where each line is something new equal a function of what was before. And you pack them together. There are two small things to be a little bit careful. In some places there are max and mins. So it means that you can have angles, so things that are not differentiable in theory. And you have a square root, same thing. If you are at zero, th there is an infinite slope. So it means that if you have zero risk, then computing the derivative or the sensitivity of your risk with respect to something will give you strange numbers. But apart from those technical difficulties, if you look at it from far away enough, that's quite easy as formulas. So I have applied those formulas and the AD version to uh, that computation, and I think that's what I have, yeah. So let me now, that I have put two things together, the methodology and this uh, computation of capital, or IM, together, let me look at how to apply AD in practice. And the first, you can expect it from what I've described, the inputs of FRTB or SIM are the derivative, the sensitivities. So there I will use AD a first time. So, first one, I will be quite quick on the description and I will show a couple of results in terms of CPU time computation. So, uh, for my example will be in this case interest rate market where I have to compute those sensitivities of the present value with respect to all the inputs. So I've put very quickly the algorithm that I've used to do that. I have the inputs from the market, the interest rate from the market. My first step is to calibrate the curves, the zero curve, so from the raw data to the calibrated data that you have certainly in your uh, in libraries an algorithm to do that. What do I have to use or remember to be able to do AD later? What I need is the derivative of each step. What is the big step in the calibration is to go from the row par rate or market quotes into the zero rate or calibrated quotes or calibrated numbers, parameters. And for that, I will store this change from one to the other and its derivative, usually called the Jacobian. 
Uh, how is the calibration done usually? You have plenty of inputs. You want those calibrated curves. So you throw all your requests, all your instruments, into a big uh, machine that will compute, uh, find the roots of your problem. And by itself, the best or one of the most efficient way to compute the roots of this multidimensional system is by a Newton-like root finding exercise. And this itself will use the gradient or the derivative of your target function. So even in the computation of the function itself, in this case it's already using derivatives. So already AD is useful even to compute the value and then you store this Jacobian to be able to compute the derivatives later. So um, I will say that later, but I will uh, start already here. The AD approach is not only a numerical technique, it's also a philosophy. You have to remember what you do and keep in mind all those pieces. So AD is already used for the value and then use again the same numbers to compute the derivatives later. Uh, yeah, and then once you have computed, for example, the sensitivity with respect to zero rate, you can multiply by the Jacobian to get the sensitivity to the, mar, uh, the par rate. So this is fairly standard approach. So everybody is doing that in their libraries, I'm sure. And this has been done a, a, around 1,000 times in the different banks and hedge funds that are here. And what I did is to take uh, the code from Open Gamma. I have to mention at least the company once. <laughs> and I feel free to mention it because the code which is doing that is open source. So you can go on GitHub, download it and use it for free. So I think I'm allowed to mention something which is free. Um, and I did that and I took a simple example, three currencies, three curves. 12 nodes each curve, that's the, the SIM or 10 for FRTB, and the number of swaps, 25 desks, 3 currencies, 30 swaps by currency. Again, it's just to have numbers to play with. I did the curve calibration, that takes 28 milliseconds. I compute the PV of all the swaps, that's 27 milliseconds. And then I have applied AD. I don't have time to go through the details, but once you have seen the methodology, you have an idea of how it will apply. What was the result for the computation of derivatives? Actually, value and AD for the calibration was the same time. The reason being what I've mentioned earlier, even to compute the value, you use this uh, Newton-like method, which requires the derivative. So when you compute the value, you have already computed the derivative. You just have to store them. So that's free. Uh, for the swap, actually, in the library, the ratio is not as good as I promised. It's only 8 instead of 4 to compute my mm, something like 20-something derivatives. So it's not always perfect uh, in practice. In this case, I'm computing a little bit more number than what I need because I I use them for something else, but I cannot lie because it's open source. So you can run the code yourself. So uh, this is what I have in practice. And when you look at the total to compute the, the value and all the sensitivities, that's roughly the ratio. Even if you have a lot of sensitivities to compute here in a ratio of five, so the time to compute five PV, I've been able to compute all the sensitivities of my full book. So. If I was using finite difference, I would go from 260 to 1600, so I've saved, I've divided the computation time by 6. That's very standard related to sensitivities, FRTB and SIM. What I'd like to do now, I think it's the, my next, yeah, next part, was to do something a little bit different, because that slide, I'm sure you have seen it 10 times already by different vendors and so on. So I wanted to do a, something a little bit different. And for that, I want to, to look at the next step, like I did in my magical trick at the start. 
I want to compute, I will have a portfolio. I want to compute the capital of that associated to that portfolio, but also the sensitivities, the derivative of the capital. The capital itself is using sensitivities, but the sensitivities of that capital with respect to the change of the bank, the change of the positions. So I have a bank with a big portfolio, and that portfolio is divided in sub-portfolios or sub-positions or trades or whatever. So this is a piece of the bank. Let's call it P for piece or for portfolio. So my total is summing, aggregating different pieces. I want to compute my measurement, let's say capital, of this big piece. And I'm interested also by the sensitivity or the, the marginal. So what is happening when I move one of those numbers by a small quantity. So I will compute that I'm interested also by the derivative of this quantity with respect to the, the numbers, the, the position I have. So that's what I'm targeting. And I will use that for two things. So incremental capital or incremental IM, so if I move one of the position, but also I want to apply it to attribution. For me, attribution is I have one number computed for my bank, and I want to split that number in different numbers in an additive way to attribute it to each desk, to each trader in the bank. So I want to do incremental, which is just this derivative, and also attribution. And to do attribution, I need a second formula, yeah, which is Euler, also some kind of Greek guy, <laughs> uh, Euler uh, function, or Euler theorem about homogeneous function, which says the following. If you have a function which is homogeneous uh, of degree one, so if the function at lambda times x is lambda, the function at x. So if you double your position, you double your risk. That's roughly what it says. So if you have something which satisfies that, then you can write your function f like a sum of something. And that's what I want. I want to write my capital as the sum of capital of uh, the parts. And this number here involves the computation of the partial derivatives, so the sensitivities. So that's where uh, my uh, AD methods will be useful. Uh, I think next slide is try to have the intuition for that formula quickly. Yes, it is. So I have my function. You have to see x, y in two dimensions. Unfortunately, the screen is only two dimension, and I need two dimension for the position, a third one for the capital, so I need a three dimensional screen. I don't think you have that yet, so I will stay in two dimensions, sorry for that. So you have to view that as a two dimensional plane. This is my capital, or the value of my function. What do I know? If I take one point, in that direction, going to the origin, it is linear, so it's homogeneous of degree one, so it's a line. So this is a fair representation of my function. It's just that around it, if I go in this direction, I don't know what it will be, some kind of cone with a little bit of shape, I don't know exactly, but I have just one cut, the one I know, which is just a line. Now, if I go and increase a little bit in that direction. It will stay aligned. So I create my new function g, which is going to f in my initial direction by a small amount. So that's my g. And you can see that the derivative of g, so this slope, will be related to this value. So if I call it this length 1, so 1 plus a little bit, so this value will be equal to this slope. So the value is equal to the derivative of this intermediary function. And if you compute the derivative of that by the composition, 
derivative with respect to the first one multiplied by x. So if you compute the derivative with respect to epsilon, the same here, derivative with respect to the second one multiplied by y. So you have x, first derivative, y, second derivative. So that's a way to view it through some kind of intuition or through a simple graph. And you can do that in any number of dimension. Again, it will cost more because we need a screen with more dimension, but uh, at least in one dimension you can view it there. So this is the function or the result I will use now for my attribution. And yeah, so in practice, again, I have my portfolio made of small pieces. I glue the piece together and I compute one capital for everything. This capital depends of how much I take of each piece. Let's suppose I take one of each desk. So that's the, cap the initial capital. And I will write it as this sum of those partial derivatives. So if I'm able to compute those partial derivatives of this abstract function, I will have my attribution. And in practice, what do I have? So my portfolio are made, in my examples of SIM or uh, FRTB, they are made of some sensitivities, plenty of them, and I can compute by AD the derivative of the total with respect to each of those individual inputs. So the derivative with respect to each of the S, the sensitivities, of the total of the total, that is free, not free, just cheap, with my AD. So I have all those numbers. How do I get what I want? The derivative with respect to one of those X, derivative with one of those X of the total, with the X appearing in several of those pieces. Again, you know how to compute the derivative of a composition. Uh, you compute the derivative uh, with respect to each of those s, multiply by the derivative of this with respect to x. So it is the derivative with respect to s, multiply by, sorry, derivative with respect to x of this quantity s. So all the attribution is al almost free, just summing and uh, multiplying, if you have all those numbers. All those numbers, that's what I had at the very start, when you have IAD, they are coming for free. So all, everything which is there is very cheap. And that's what I go back to my first slide, my magical slide, computing with that desk uh, of equity was 40 milliseconds. Computing all the 40,000 derivative was 144. Br adding them together in my uh, 100 uh, subdesk, adding numbers in a computer takes zero, so you cannot even see it <laughs> here, it's somewhere in the decimals. Uh, so computing those 40,000 or those 100 numbers takes exactly the same time in practice, and that's the type of result you can get with that. I think I have, oh yeah, I obviously did the same for interest rate because I like interest rate. I took back my uh, three currencies and 25 desk, applied the same with curve calibration, PV. So this is a little bit longer in terms of intuition. You have first to calibrate, compute the PV, compute the sensitivities with respect to all the, the sensitivities and so on. But if you add all that, computing the capital, uh, 28 milliseconds, 27, 15, that's a total of 70. If you want to compute all the sensitivity of all the numbers I've discussed up to now, uh, that was free, that was in the previous slide something like 200 milliseconds. Here computing the sensitivities, I have less of them, was only 27 milliseconds. So the capital itself, 70, the capital, plus the attribution between my 25 desk, plus the sensitivity with respect to all the intermediary sensitivities I have, all those uh, 5,000 number or so, 
are included in that number and that a ratio of 4.1 with the initial number. So that's the type of things you can obtain with AD. Um, I don't remember, oh yeah, I think I have one extra slide, yeah. So I've said already there are in this problem two ways to use AD, one for the inputs, the sensitivities, two for the attribution or the marginal, and I've added a third one because I like it uh, so much that there is a third one for free. Uh, now, I've computed sensitivities, this marginal, with respect to the numbers that are the inputs, the sensitivities. Now, if you tell me the capital is increasing by $5 for each dollar you add on the PVO1 of the five-year swap, that may help a dealer, but may not help your salesperson that does not know what's the relation between notional of swaps and the PVO1. So maybe you want also to have all the numbers discussed, not in terms of PVO1, but in terms of notional. What is the link between notional and PVO1? There is just a multiplication, which is coming from a derivative. So if you have stored at the right moment the right derivative, you have already computed you can magically take it back and all the numbers that you had previously put them back uh, as uh, notional. That's what I have done in this example. I took my random portfolio, I computed the capital, then I computed the sensitivity of the capital with respect to the PVO1. So in this case, if I increase the PVO1 of the 30 years euro, my capital decreased by 49 uh, sterling. This was a sterling bank. So that's a number for each PVO1. And by using AD, not in a direct way, but indirect way, by storing the ratio between notional and PVO1, which is just a derivative, I can get again for free the same report, but no in terms of a 1 million notional, if I remember well. If I increase my, uh, my position by 1 million uh, sterling on my euro uh, position, so sterling equivalent, my capital requirement will increase by uh, 128,000 uh, sterling. So again, it is not something you will see directly in AD books, but that's something you can do in practice. If you understand the philosophy of AD, you have stored your derivatives, you know what they mean, and you can take them back and reuse them. Um, I think, yeah, that's the last line of this presentation, which is very important for me, is that AD is not only a numerical technique, it's really a philosophy of using the composition, using multiplication of derivatives, those kind of things, and using them uh, not only to compute numbers, but for your business. So that's, um, I think, the last line of my presentation. Oh, conclusion, obviously. Uh, Hopefully I've convinced you that algorithmic differentiation is useful for things like SIM and FRTB. It's useful for the inputs. It's also useful for the outputs you, if you want to do attribution or marginals. So it, it's used uh, twice in this case. The gain you can expect, that depends on the number of sensitivities. But in the example I've shown and the one in practice I'm doing, uh, between a ratio or a gain of 5 to 100, depending on how many sensitivities, is something you can expect uh, from uh, those techniques. And my last word will be, there are a couple of standard books about uh, algorithmic differentiation. They have been written mainly by computer scientists, so not me. I'm a mathematician. I don't know if you have noticed it yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there are... Uh, Griv Wang and what's his name? I forgot the name, let me check the name. And Walter, that's a very standard book in computer science from 2008. There is a book by Noman, uh, another computer scientist. 
the, the advantage of the, that new that other books it's linked to some uh, actual libraries that he is selling with NAG. So I'm not advertising for them, but you can buy the, uh, those libraries also. And my last slide is an advertisement for myself, which is the book on algorithmic differentiation, which is with the editor and will be out in roughly a month or so. And the price of the book, if you go today on Amazon, is 14.99 in pounds, so which is one cent less than what you have paid to come here. So I don't know what's uh, your uh, budget for the year on spending on AD, uh, but if you have not spent all the, the budget yet, there is still the possibility for the same price, even one cent less, uh, to have a little bit more information. And that will be the end of my presentation. Happy to, to take questions and yeah, questions. Um, are any of the Open Gamma people here? Yeah, there are a couple of us. Why 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 would you have open source um, platforms like this? Why would you give this information away to capital markets? Uh, uh, first <laughs> I don't think there is so many secrets. There you need a lot of time to implement things, but I don't think there is secrets. So many people move from one bank to the other, one vendor to the other. There is nothing secret in what I've said. So there is no secrecy. What we believe is that by giving away, uh, but no, I'm giving my secrets also, uh, giving away the code, it's some kind of marketing exercise. Nobody will take the code and run away with it. People need to time to implement it, uh, to understand it, and so on. So by showing the transparency and giving away the code, we hope that the people will come and ask us to help them and believe that we understand what we are doing. Now, we can try to sell it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I should ask me <laughs> the question to you <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> Is it something you are interested in to see the open source code? Or do you trust us enough that just saying that we do it properly is enough for you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I don't think there is a lot of, at least that's the starting point of the company, that there is enough in the, uh, giving the code is not enough. You need to understand it and so on. And that's where we hope to, to make uh, uh, some money and to sell services around it. The regulator are very keen that you know that uh, the code needs to be available to the banks because you know uh, you know treating like a, a, a you know uh, as a black box is not basically something permissible by by the regulator. So it's something that uh, I, I, I think that's really uh, important that to have like a the code available to the user. Otherwise, uh, it will be very hard to convince. Are, are you a regulator by any chance? <laughs> Are you a regulator by any no, chance? No. no. Okay. <laughs> what a pity. Uh, <laughs> we have the regulator basically on our back. Yeah, I, I, I agree because those things are, as I said, so standard and so on. It would be very nice to have things transparent. Uh, but for example, we have tried. Is there anybody from ISDA in the room? No? <laughs> Are you recording what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, okay, too bad. Uh, we have tried to open source the SIM code, which is implementing the ISDA methodology. ISDA was, didn't agree with that. So we have not open source SIM, uh, even if the methodology is well known, because some people don't want to be too transparent, or maybe it's not too transparent, they don't want to make it too easily available, or something like that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the transparency is not yet uh, <laughs> something that everybody wants or everybody is <coughs> pushing for. But if the, the, the regulators want to be more transparent, I will be very happy. Uh, can I ask, are you from a bank or from a hedge fund? Yeah, from a bank, yeah. Okay, from a bank. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, just one comment on, on the attribution I just mentioned on the AD. I think although I, I can see uh, basically that, uh, that, that it's very useful, useful for, you know, for the SIM uh, in the sense that you want to see what, you, uh, what is basically the, the attribution for each trade in terms of uh, 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 contribution in the SIM uh, so that you can charge the desk 
uh, how much, you know, how much they, how much they, they, they contribute, uh, yeah. mm. you know, to, to uh, in terms of total cost. But uh, in terms of capital, I think what I'm struggling with the capital is you are just looking at one side of the capital. The capital is like there's so many components in the capital that not sensitivity based. Yeah. So this is. And, and it will be very hard to use that revision. I mean, what you what you what you looked at uh, FRTB as FRTB is just one component of the of the capital, which is sensitivity based. But there is other components which are not sensitivity based, which will be very difficult to use the AD for attribution. I, I don't think so. <laughs> so we, so I effectively yes, I I looked only at in this presentation this sp special part. But if you look at FRTB itself, there are not only the sensitivity base, but there are also the notional base for the exotics and other parts for the uh, default uh, contribution and so on. Those you can also use the same approach. Uh, it's even easier if you have a number which is just a notional sensitivities, you just change a notional. So we have done those type of attribution for plenty of others, for initial margin, for CCPs, for SIM, uh, for capital, for soccer and uh, CEM and so on. So uh, it's a principle you can uh, apply in plenty of other cases. And, and as you said, once someone has to pay something like a capital or a charge, he wants to charge his internal <laughs> uh, desk and uh, business line and so on. So the attribution came from clients asking to internally split those cost and find a, a way to find someone responsible for paying for it. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions or <laughs> there are special <laughs> language between <laughs> Oh yes, yes, uh, Paul, Paul has an announcement. Thank you very much. So yep. I presume there are no, no more questions. But I will be there around if you want right. uh, for drinks and questions. At, uh, at the bar after, after this. <laughs> um, so I'm going to stop recording as well. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> it was a fantastic